Welcome everyone to our first of two Ma poetry month. Uh, it's National Poetry Month here in April, and we started off this week with math and poetry. And next week, Michael will be coming back with social studies and poetry. So thank you for joining us today for rhyme and rhythm in math and poetry. I'm Tracy Wiley with Georgia Public Broadcasting, your education specialist for North Georgia. And I'm joined by my colleague in the South, Michael Kinlan. Hello, Mike. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Alexander. Good to be with you guys. Wonderful. Mike's going to be in the background. He is uh, the wizard behind the curtain. So he will be answering your chats or keeping up with you on Facebook Live or on, on um, here at Zoom. So please feel free to participate, throw in your questions, your answers, and Mike will be there to catch them and bring them up. And Mike will also jump in with his infinite wisdom. I'm very excited that it's Poetry Month because, of course, uh, when I think of poetry, I often think of Shakespeare. And when I think of Shakespeare, I always think of Alexander Parker from Wordplay. So he is here with us. How are you today, Alexander? Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm well, Tracy. Uh, hi to you. Hi to Mike. And thank you for having me along. Great pleasure. Yes, it's been a while. So we're really excited um, to have you back in the, the seat with us here at GPB on our live uh, webinars. So Alexander's also going to jump in with his wisdom when we get to the parts, especially about Shakespeare and um, things that Mike and I in our science and our social studies background are not as uh, clever about. That's why we brought Alexander in to help us in those areas. So between the three of us, hopefully um, we'll have lots of fun stuff for you today. All right, our learning goal for you as teachers is to help your students identify and understand mathematical patterns. So of course, we're trying to find that balance between the patterns in poetry that give the power to the words. So they'll be able to understand the quantitative structure behind the meaning. And ultimately, they'll be able to create their own uh, sonnets based on the, the strength of the structure that they've learned through the, uh, this lesson plan. So that's our goal for our students. And of course, today we are presenting for you as teachers or parents so that you have some ideas about how to share this content and these games and these activities with your kids and help them with this learning goal. We are actually today going to be following the five E's. So we're going to go right through a lesson plan from beginning to end today. It's a wonderful lesson plan from the University of Oklahoma's K20 Learn section. 5E e lesson plans on Shakespearean sonnets and iambic pentameter. Hard to say that five times fast. Um, if you're working on pent pentameters, haha. Ha. So there are five sections here, got lots of fives going on, five E's, pentameters. Engage is where we're going to start off, uh, just something simple to really get your kids interested in the topic. Then we go into explore where we let them play around with the information without really having a lot of info, a lot of content and knowledge, but just see what they can do with what they know so far. Then we go into explain where we really start to teach them some of the patterns and structures give them the, the information they need to know to, to start mastering the content. Then we do extend and make those real world connections between their knowledge and what's out there and their own interests. And then we end up with evaluate where they get to create sonnets with their classmates and then on their own, um, either in a jigsaw or in this lovely poetry cafe at the end where they can sip on their tea um, in the spirit of Shakespeare and listen to their, their classmates sonnets. All right, so the first part, engage. And I love engage because it's the idea is just to start simple and to start with something fun. And so why not start with what is a syllable? Even though these kids are in middle school and high school and they know what a syllable is, they learn that in kindergarten, it's great just to review a little bit. One syllable cat, two syllables catchy, three syllables catacomb. And what I like to do in this part is to often go back to pre-K, preschool, or early elementary resources, just to kind of, again, make it approachable and fun for them. So for this, I did find this fun little video about what is a syllable. I'm not gonna play the whole thing for you, but I do wanna play uh, this little bit so that you can kind of see um, you know, what, what this part of the of the webinar can be, or the, the lesson can be like the engage part. So let's play a little bit of this so you can uh, get an idea of how you can use these fun early education resources for your secondary kids. Hi, hook everybody. The English language has a many words like this. Huh. So many words. And every word can be split into parts. We call these parts syllables. Syllables! 
a word could have one or two or three or four or even more syllables. Syllables! Could a word have one million syllables? No, that is too many syllables. What about four syllables? Yes, I already said that. Ha! No more questions! Okay, so that's kind of the flavor of this very silly video. And I have to tell you, I watched it all the way through and was delighted to the very end. So if you really uh, want to go back and watch this five minute video about syllables, it is hilarious. But it's a great way to get your kids again, sort of engaged in uh, syllables are boring. Maybe not. Next part, what is a rhyme? And for this part, we're going to play a little game. We're going to do a rhyming round robin. And so I am, I haven't told Mike yet, but he is going to be a part of this game um, where we are, each one of us, uh, myself, Alexander, and, and Mike, are going to choose a word and we're going to have 30 seconds in order to uh, try and come up with as many rhymes for this word as we can. And then we're going to move on to the, the word of the person next to us. So if I start with one, when I'm done with my 30 seconds, I'll move on to two. If I start with three, I'll move on to one. So we're going to be doing this, you know, moving on from column to column. And for each column, we'll have 30 seconds to come up with as many rhymes as we can to the word. Knowing, of course, that even if you have a three syllable word, you don't necessarily have to rhyme all three syllables. Shakespeare didn't do that sometimes, all the time anyway. Sometimes he would rhyme a three syllable word with a one syllable word or a two syllable word. So keep that in mind that if um, whoever gets this three syllable word is not necessarily um, having the hardest of the three. Okay, so here is our rhyming round robin. I'm gonna give Mike and Alexander a minute to join in to this. And if anyone else is out there, feel free to join in as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and paste, or Mike, if you wouldn't mind pasting in the chat, or if you already, you probably already did, didn't you? <laughs> there it is, thanks. So Mike has pasted in the chat um, the little link to join the Padlet, or if you're on Nearpod, you can join the Padlet as well. And you'll see the first column is stage, the second column is remove, and the third column is overthrow. So um, Alexander, since you're our guest, I'll let you pick first. Which one would you like to rhyme? You have um, to do all three of them eventually, but. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll, I'll go with stage, um, and I'm just going to make sure I can log on to Nearpod. So give me a second to do that. Excellent. Um, and Mike, that. you want second choice? Sure. Um, one quick background, Tracy, uh, top of your screen has that blacked out thing. Thank you. Is that a yep. little better? A little better. Yep. Actually, I'm probably just going to go like that. That works even better. I will go with remove, so I'll leave the other one to you. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we'll give everyone a chance to be in the Padlet where you can click on the plus sign and add your little words there like I've just done. And I'm gonna start the timer as soon as everyone's ready. And then we will have 30 seconds for each one. Alexander, now, you feeling good? Uh, I have to, I believe I have to type in the code. I've just logged into, so I have to type in 6V4HZ, correct? Yes, if you wanna join the Nearpod, sounds perfect. And you'll be in there with us. Okay. I'll see the little number two will pop up down here in the left when you're with us. And uh, welcome to your lesson, other optional name, uh, join lesson, bingo. All right. Um, do, do you see me, am, am I, so I have stage and am I present? Yes, I, I, if you can see stage and you can click on that little plus, you are all ready to go. And right. Mike's got remove and I'm doing overthrow. So okay. I'm gonna do three, two, one, and then we will start our 30 seconds. Three, two, one, go. Okay, we got five seconds left. Three, two, one, stop. Okay, now we're gonna move on. So I'm gonna go from overthrow to stage. Alexander's gonna go from stage to remove and Mike's gonna go from remove to overthrow and we will have another 30 seconds. You ready? On your mark, yeah. set, go.
Yep. One more second. Okay, stop. Um, I don't think I did so well there, but you're ready to move on. Wow, yeah, but I didn't, I don't believe I got it. I even though I typed in a bunch. So oh I wait, see him. I see okay. him. All right. So next one, I'm moving on to behoove. Mike is moving on to uh, stage. I'm sorry, I'm moving on to remove. Mike's moving on to stage. And Alexander, you've gone, you're going to overthrow. You ready? Okay. On your mark, get set, go. All right, we're out of time. <laughs> That's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> All right, so then ultimately, at the last bit, what will happen is you'll go back to your own word. So my word was overthrow, and I see there's undertow, bestow, no so, bow, outflow, grow, mo slow, pro, bo, bro, and crow. So then I can go and say, is there anything else that I want to add? Maybe I can try and come up with some more three syllable words like undertow, um, but you can see how it gives you an idea of how you can continue. So any thoughts on this just to as a game to have fun with um, secondary rhyming and make kids understand that it's maybe not as easy as they think it is to come up with rhymes in a poem. I have no further thoughts other than that was indeed <laughs> harder than I expected. <laughs> Much harder. Yeah, I was I'm really trying to come up with three syllable words, but um, or two syllable words. Um, whoever is this you uh, improve and approve very well done there. Um, and uh, so I think we, we did pretty well, I think. And different ways to spell things, right? Bow and so. Mm -hmm. So that's fun for the overthrow one. And how smooth goes with remove, even though it doesn't have the OVE. So I like some of these, really great. So thank you guys. So this particular strategy is really just like plus one routine where you first recall what you've learned and then you pass your, your learning on to your group member. They add to your learning, they pass it to the next person and eventually it comes back to you and you do the act, which is that you read through, review all the additions and then you can come up with some additional ideas. So it's a great way for a group to build upon each other's knowledge. And this is just one example of how you can do it, like in a rhyme, a rhyming round robin. So hopefully those are some ideas for engaging, you know, really fun, cheeky videos and some fun games. And I'm gonna pause there at the end of our first E, which is engage and see if there are any questions or comments from um, you two or from any of our participants out there in Facebook or Zoom. And while we are waiting, I'm going to invite Alexander to tell us about this connection between math and Shakespeare that he has uncovered. Sure. So, uh, you know, Tracy and I spoke about this and we dug around in the uh, Shakespeare canon and we, we just looked for any connection between numbers and Shakespeare. And there are many ways to go. And obviously we're looking at you know, rhyming schemes and so forth. Uh, King Lear, uh, there's an interesting moment very, very early on in the play where he is dividing his kingdom between his three daughters. And he uses this very famous phrase, uh, which is nothing can come of nothing. And what makes that somewhat more interesting, obviously, is that nothing by definition is zero, it is nullity. Um, and it's what he says his daughter is going to get for not having done the right thing by say by flattering him essentially um and what's interesting about it is is that the whole concept uh, of zero or the naught uh came to england around about the time that shakespeare was working there's a as it says here there's a welsh, welsh mathematician uh, and a physician called robert record um, and he did introduce um uh, arabic numeral system to, to britain and 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 so it's almost certain that shakespeare was aware of this and as we know Shakespeare was playful with not just words but also with ideas 
and was very interested. And, and so he took something which was represented nothing. And if you will, as we were talking about Tracy and I say, he made something of it, which is he made it one of the central ideas of King Lear as he, as he takes away you know, uh, his daughter's portion of the kingdom from him. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's just um, one little sort of snippet into, as always, the sort of the genius of Shakespeare, always playing with what for those times were cutting edge uh, ideas. I, another little historical footnote, Robert Record is also said to have been the person who introduced two symbols into mathematical annotation, namely the equal sign uh, and the plus sign. So uh, an, a remarkable man. Tracy? That's fascinating. I, I love, like you said earlier, when we were talking about this, the concept of not having zero, you know, as part of your, your um, I guess, mathematical vocabulary uh, is a fascinating idea. Mike, anything out there you'd like to add from your own uh, mind or from our participants? I'm, I'm, I come from the, uh, the, the world history background where they talk about the, the movement of algebra from India into Arab culture and then through trade and exploration into Europe and uh, the discussion of the, the placeholder zero and how that changed the way people looked at numeracy and stuff like that. I had no idea there was such a great connection to, uh, to Shakespeare, that's fantastic. But I love how you've just brought economics into this discussion. <laughs> that's how Mike effortlessly brings social studies in. So yes, um, so economics is, uh, from what I understand is what you're saying, kind of drove the nothing into Europe. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's also, it's, it's funny, you know, when, when Mike said that, you know, it's like carbon dating something. How do you identify the age? You can sort of see traces of culture, even in as simple a word as nothing, right? I mean, a concept, a principle, and it makes its way into great literature. You know, it's, it's a little bit like saying that, you know, there's a new paint that's been discovered, which allows painters to paint with a new color. In this case, he's playing with an idea. And as always, he takes a simple word and plays with it. And we'll be talking about that in a few minutes time as well. Great, wonderful. All right, so moving on to number two of the five E's, this is explore. So we've engaged our students and now we're gonna to start to let them play with some of the knowledge that they have. All that we've given them so far is rhyme and rhythm, right? Rhymes and syllables. They may have some previous knowledge that they're going to bring into this section, but we're not really assessing them on what they, sh you know, what they don't know yet. It's really on, on their skills. So we're asking them to look for rhyme and rhythm, to look for patterns, and then as they're doing that, to learn how to structure themselves. It's very in this very early part of just exploring. So in terms of science, just getting dirty, getting in there, messing around with stuff, failing forward. It's all good. Just seeing what you can come up with. And of course, the teacher can also be watching and observing what her or his students know or do not know, and that can really help with that relationship going forward. So for this one, we wanted to uh, introduce you to a little bit of content from PBS Learning Media. This is a streaming service that we sponsor here at Georgia Public Broadcasting. You can see uh, in the left-hand corner, it says PBS Learning Media. And to get to this site, you would type GPB pbslearningmedia.org. You'll see the GPB next to the PBS, and then you can either log in, and that way you have access to your own content and your own dashboard, and you can manipulate the content, or not log in. It is an open resource. You can still access the content, even if you don't create an account. It's just good to have that extra uh, tools with your account that when you do create it, totally free. So I wanted to play a little bit of this from, again, Shakespeare Uncovered. It's a wonderful little excerpt from the sonnet that is created at the meeting of Romeo and Juliet called Love at First Sonnet here. I'm just going to play a little bit of this so students, again, can start to hear what a sonnet sounds like and see how it's acted out. So again, this is just part of the, the listening and the looking at a sonic, looking for patterns, looking for meaning, looking for structure as they're exploring the math and the poetry. 
So that's just a portion of that video. It does go on uh, to talk more about this meeting and about the sonnet, but just it was such a great introduction because it does talk about, you know, the 14 lines, about the shared speaking. I love that there's diversity in this clip, that it's modernized. You'll notice he's wearing Nike sneakers. And so they're having this interaction. Um, so even though it is the old language, it has been moved up a little bit. And so it's more accessible to the modern teenager. So um, I'm going to turn this over to you, Alexander, just to talk about how you know your impressions of that and show us Wordplay Shakespeare, which is another wonderful resource for accessing that sonnet and more. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. And I and I actually, before I even talk about Wordplay very briefly, I will say that it is a great clip and it's definitely worth seeing. There are two or three really smart takes on, on the sonnet the way it's done. I mean, Marjorie Garber from Harvard says quite rightly that, that it, you don't generally have the sonnet recited in alternating by two alternating actors. So that's an innovation right there. Um, and they're right, it's a, it's a dangerous flirtation um, and it is love come to life. And then they're given these lines. It's, 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 it's really well done. So um, Wordplay Shakespeare, which uh, we've been working with GPB uh, to, to get out to more schools is essentially uh, an annotated uh, and and, and combined form of Shakespeare ebook. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and log in uh, with a username and a password. Um, and it's very simple uh, and we think it's quite helpful. Uh, it, it, essentially what we have done, and I'll just go, in, in fact, I'll go to act one, scene five, which is the moment which we just watched. It's a, a, it's a ebook uh, which allows us to put a filmed performance uh, on the page uh, next to the text. So um, if we go a few pages forward uh, and we go here. I will withdraw, but this intrusion shall, now seeming sweet, convert to bitterest gall. Now, that's the two lines that come just before we see the part which we just watched on that, on that show. Uh, this is, um, you know, Tybalt uh, fuming that uh, young Romeo has come to a Capulet ball and he thinks he's there to mock them. He, of course, isn't. He's spotted Juliet and has fallen head over heels in love. So uh, in addition to the performance, we have extra materials that are added on. So we have a modern English translation, a Spanish translation, an even simpler English translation, page summaries, glossaries, links to other resources, notes, uh, and, um, and uh, we even, and we have some questions also uh, to help people along. In fact, this question, I'd forgotten about this, is about uh, rhyming schemes, which we will be getting to very, very, very soon. So that's a quick introduction to why, to some extent, why I'm here and uh, what we're looking at with Wordplay Shakespeare. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing again, uh, or relinquish the share back to Tracy. Um, and uh, and is, is that was that enough coverage, Tracy, or would you like me to go into more depth? I think that's good, and we'll definitely um, we're going to go back into wordplay Shakespeare again, so you can show us more uh, depth as you mentioned. And then, of course, uh, please do reach out to us at GPB, and we'll also give you information on how to um, how to reach out to Alexander as well if you would like to have your own free account through the end of the school year, and then you can also um, access the content. All right, so moving along, I'm gonna go back to my shared screen. And we are going into further into this idea of explore. So of course, when you introduce your kids um, if, to Shakespeare, oftentimes they're not quite sure what's going on. They may not recognize some of the language. They may, it is of course, old English. It might be a very much over their heads but you want them to still start recognizing patterns if they can. So even if they don't understand the words necessarily, can they recognize the patterns in the sonnet? And one way to help them with recognizing those patterns is to go to something a little bit more uh, maybe familiar. So there's this great website called Pop Song Sonnets where this gentleman, Eric Didrikson, has taken pop songs and he has turned them into Shakespearean sonnets with the typical 14 lines and iambic pentameter that we're gonna talk about a little bit later um, so that the, the kids may recognize the, the lyrics of the song, but they can start to, to put the patterns together even if they know nothing. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I put this up on the screen for you guys to look at and see if you recognize this particular song, the devil wanting damned souls did go. And maybe Alexander, you could read this because I think you're much better at the meter than I am. 
<laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I will say, however, that that's one of the joys of working with GPB is that I continue and, and with you, Tracy and Mike, I, I discover these things. This just made me smile when you introduced this to me yesterday. So, yeah, the, uh, the, <laughs> we're in Georgia. I guess that's the key <laughs> as to what's going on here. You know, so um, uh, bingo. Uh, the devil wanting damned souls did go into the southern lands to strike a deal wherein he found a lad whose nimble bow did dance her fiddle strings with frenzied zeal. Good lad, he said, I'll gladly wager thee thy soul against my golden violin. If thou canst better play a song than me, the lad spat I'm the best that's ever been. I don't know if that's remotely correct in terms of its intonation, but but I just, this is tremendous. I love this. I think it's great. Okay, Mike, we're gonna put you in the hot spot as our student. So can you go in there and tell us what tune you think that is and, and pick out any patterns that stand out to you? That has got to be Charlie Daniels. <laughs> Boom, right? <laughs> Good job. Yeah. yeah, so let's see. Uh, what, so deal, zeal, uh, but then go. the, me, violin, bin. So I see patterns, but I don't fully understand. Okay, one, two, three. Ooh, you got to tell me the pattern. There's threes, but they don't, they aren't arranged like one, two, three, one, two, three, right? But see, that's great. That's what we want for the kids to do at this point. We don't want them to necessarily go in there and say, oh, it's iambic pentameter and da, da, da. We want them to be like, oh, go rhymes with bow. And, you know, violin rhymes with bin and start to see, I see that there's something going on here. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's not just, you know, willy nilly, there is a pattern. Um, and so we've taken this, the devil went down to Georgia and we've put it into this structure, this pattern so that they can start rec recognizing mathematical patterns. And of course it's more fun because they you know, know the song and then some of the words of course may be more familiar with them. And so when they go back to Shakespeare, they see the patterns are the same and it makes Shakespeare more approachable as well. And I, I, sh I should pitch in that as an, as an Englishman, you may, have, you may have heard that this is not a Georgia accent. Uh, I was. <laughs> I was well aware of, of uh, the Charlie Daniels song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, even when I was living in England as a young kid. So, uh, so it's, uh, I assume that this is compulsory for every Georgian kid to know this song, but it's tremendous. I think this is so funny and, and clever. Yeah, so, so the, here's that website where I got it from. So as teachers out there, you'll see that this is, um, it is no longer um, active, but before it, it went defunct, um, uh, this gentleman, he came up with a lot of them. So you'll see we've got everything from Kermit the Frog to the Beatles to the Rembrandts, um, LMFAO. So there's a lot going on, Ed Sheeran. So it's a really a great repository for teachers to go in here and find some Shakespearean sonnets that um, have been built around these, these really popular pop songs, or pop songs, I guess, means popular, and uh, get their kids a little bit more engaged um, as they're exploring uh, the sonnet and the form of the sonnet. And then, of course, once they've kind of played with it a little bit, started to recognize some of the patterns, you can maybe even uh, sort of bump it up a notch and do some scrambled sonnets where you take some of the sonnets. This particular one is just um, the last six lines, the, the last quatrain and the couplet. And so I've chopped off the end of that uh, sonnet that we saw between Romeo and Juliet and mi mixed up all the lines. And so give it to the kids in this portion and say, can you put it in order? You know, trying to remember some of the patterns that you've noticed, trying to remember, you know, the, the three-dimensional form of the performance of the sonnet and see if they've learned at this point some of the ways to, to unscramble the sonnet. There's also a strategy called why lighting where they can go and just highlight uh, one of the lines that really spoke with them and why it did. So for instance, they may, you know, particularly like uh, this one, then move not while my prayers affect I take. And that could be the highlighted line uh, from this particular um, portion of the sonnet and they can explain why they liked that line. So again, it's really just getting them into exploring the whole, um, whole uh, content here. Here's why lighting for how to do it. And that comes to the end of explore. And I'm gonna pause there, see if uh, Mike or Alexander, you have anything to add from that section or um, Alexander, if you wanna talk about the, the little pause here as we're waiting for questions and comments. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a riff on this Shakespearean ratios. So again, uh, as we looked for Shakespeare numbers, patterns and so forth, 
um, I came across some fun facts and was sort of turned them into ratios. And so, you know, it doesn't really tell us all that much about Shakespeare, but uh, it does, in a sense, tell us something. The mere fact that of all of his 37 plays, uh, that the ratio of speeches by men to women, uh, and it also computes out to the numbers of lines spoken, is in proportions of five to one. Uh, now, as we know, in Elizabethan theatre, th there were no women on the stage. There were female characters played by young boys, but still the, the accord to, um, to men was, was much greater. And this is something which in recent years, uh, there, there have been these uh, actors and these acting companies who have put on all female versions of Shakespeare to, in a sense, redress the balance. And, and there are some tremendously good performances. And I've seen a, a Henry V, where Henry V is played by a woman to amazingly good effect. So I've chalked that up once again to Shakespeare's genius that he can write lines that can be spoken beautifully by men and women. It almost doesn't matter. So that's the five to one. References to love versus hate. I think this is somewhat hopeful that even though he does talk quite a lot about hate, he certainly talks a lot more about love, 10 to one in the ratio of. Uh, and finally, one of the most uh, peculiar, <laughs> peculiar ratios, um, uh, the number of people, people like to talk about how many people get killed and how they get killed in various Shakespeare plays. Well, 26 to one is the ratio of people who die by stabbing to those who are killed by being baked into a pie. That's from Titus Andronicus. So that is a pretty obscure little ratio, but we think it's sort of memorable. Uh, definitely. I think teenagers would love this the best. I mean, lo love is great too, but I think um, deaths by stabbing versus being baked into a pie would definitely catch their attention. And then of course you can talk about ratios. <laughs> Indeed. Wonderful. Anything to add, Mike, before we move along? Um, baked into a pie is fantastic. You have my attention. Absolutely. <laughs> that sort of, rem that reminded me a little bit of the Canterbury Tales uh, which all of those absurd uh, acts of violence against one another was the Miller's mm. Tale. It's really, it, that definitely changed my mind. Um, a young boy encouraged by violence, gee. Uh, <laughs> the, way yes. you the way you approached the sonnets was fantastic. I can remember me being a social studies person. I can remember being incredibly bored when I got to sonnets and I really just wanted to get to the, the craziness and the, the violence inside Shakespeare but the sonnets I never liked. And this seems so much more approachable and fun. Um, so I, I'm a big, big fan of, uh, of this type of instruction. Likewise, by the way, um, yeah, it's good. Thanks, Mike. I like what you're saying too about the Canterbury Tales that you know, you can also bring this kind of thing into any piece of literature. So vice versa, you know, you can bring the math into any literature um, and have that sort of uh, overlap, uh, inter interdisciplinary overlap. So math can be part of all your literature. Um, find ratios in every piece of work that you are investigating and patterns and structure. All right, so moving along, part three explains. This is the part where you really get into the nitty gritty about the patterns, because we do want kids to recognize the patterns so that they become masters of that pattern and structure recognition, and they can use that mastery in throughout you know, school, because that is a skill that they will need to succeed. So what is the sonnet? I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Alexander as our resident expert on ELA and Shakespeare, and this section um, is going to be led by him, and I am ready to jump in as you need me, Alexander. So uh, Tracy, if I speak over this, will you be able to forward to the next slide? Is that possible? So that so that Absolutely. I don't have. Okay. So so yeah, the structure. We get to the nitty gritty here, which is uh, we've talked about some of the ideas behind sonnets, uh, where they appear, uh, and just referencing uh, what we just saw about people getting baked into pies. Uh, what we've done is we've looked at uh, Romeo and Juliet, and we'll we'll be seeing how Shakespeare who often wrote to some extent to show off how good he was, uh, you know, the Swan of Avon, um, uh, actually baked a couple of sonnets into Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch as a metaphor, but I, I hope you appreciate it. So a sonnet is 14 lines. Uh, and the, the word that I would use, given that we're talking about mathematics, uh, or two words, one is a formula and the other one is a pattern. Um, and that's essentially what, uh, as we explore the mechanics of a sonnet, there is a formula. And it begins with the fact that there are 14 lines. Um, and that's pretty immutable. That's pretty much always the same. Um, what happens in each of those lines is that there are almost always, there are exceptions, but by and large, 10 syllables di divided into uh, 
pairs, which we call iambic pentameter. So the iamb is these sort of two syllables which create the pentameter, five pairs of syllables per line. So if we go to the next page, uh, we'll have a look at this uh, a little bit further. Um, it's um, I, I, actually, I forgot to mention one thing. People ask me sometimes, well, what, what, where does the word sonnet come from? And it's the Italian word for a little song, a sonetto, okay? And that has nothing to do with mathematics, has everything to do with Italian. Probably created, people think, by a guy called uh, Francesco Pet Petrarch, uh, Petrarchian verse. Um, and he came up with a formula and a rhyming scheme. But the person who is probably most associated with iambic pentameter and the sonnet, as we tend to use it here, is Shakespeare, the Elizabethan uh, sonnet. Um, and as I've just said earlier on, it has 10 syllables in five pairs. Um, and the key then is how you say those five pairs. So each foot or syllable is stressed or unstressed. So a short syllable followed by a stressed long syllable. So unstressed, short, followed by a stressed syllable. So let's have a look at that. It, it's sometimes a little hard to get until you actually see, um, see it with a visual. So <clears throat> iambic meter rhythm, like ba-bum. And it is said, uh, actors say that it's meant to, or does at some level, sound like a heartbeat. Ba-bum, 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 like that. So in these iambic meter words, the things like amuse, awake, return, destroy, employ. And even in saying it in that slightly exaggerated way, you can begin to detect a rhythm, a forward motion. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. And you should feel free with your students to have them clap it or bang the, the, you know, the uh, hand on the table to get that stress, okay? So, that's the idea is, is that we're creating a structure, a formula, 14 lines. Each of those lines has 10 syllables. Those syllables are divided into sets of five with two syllables in each one. And then when you tackle them, when you, when you make them into sound, you stress them, da -dum, da -dum. so short, long, short, long. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And what sometimes confuses people is that it will split a word in, in this case, if you look at the bottom of those summers, and it's, and it's a little confusing. You, you say, oh, I'm gonna have to do two different things with this one word, but it works. Um, and, and, and we're going to also talk a little bit about some other approaches to doing that stressing. So the, we're looking at the under the engine right now, what, why this works. Some people, by the way, also ask, well, why? Why do we write sonnets? And I actually don't have a good answer for that. Um, it's, it's a thing which allows, it's a form, shall we say, which allows people to then be clever within certain limits. Um, and it's a little bit like a contest to some extent. Can you convey meaning when imposing certain rules onto the, the person? So if we go to the next, uh, the next slide, um, we'll, we'll sort of go a little bit further and then we'll sort of round this off. Um, is it, uh, oh, there we go, good, good. And so, you know, um, yeah, beautiful, thank you. So here we go with, um, um, the rhyming scheme. And I actually think, Tracy, what we'll do is we'll show the rhyming scheme by going to the next slide because otherwise A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D seems a little abstract. Mike was on the trail. Mike began to piece it together when he was looking at it, when he saw those, those sounds. This is the opening um, chorus in Romeo and Juliet. So somebody comes onto the stage to tell the audience what they're about to see. And in 14 very neat lines, Essentially, Shakespeare tells you the whole story in 14 lines. Doesn't mean you can get away with not reading the rest of the play, I'm afraid to say, but it is. And he does it in a sonnet form. Let's look at the ending sound as we go down here. Dignity, scene. Let's give dignity the letter A because of the sound itty. And then we'll go with scene. Let's give that the letter B, eem. And then we come with mutiny. Sounds like itty, tinny. So that's an A. Unclean rhymes with scene, so we give that a B. So are we expecting another A or a B? Oh, now we go to foes, that's neither, so that's a third sound. Let's give it a C, and so on. We give a D to a pair of Starcast lovers take their life, and then overthrows, works with foes, strife, works with life, love with remove, although there is a little bit of a different inflection there, rage with stage, attend and mend. Now, 
what we have is the form that Shakespeare chose and which he produced in approximately, I think it's like 154 sonnets, which is a quatrain, four lines that work together. Then you shift to another four. So A, B, A, B, all right? C, D, C, D, that's quatrain number two. C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, that's quatrain number three. And then you just tie it up with two same ending sounds of attend and mend, G, G. So four plus four plus four is 12. Uh, uh, is that right? Yes, that is right, 12. Uh, plus two is 14. I'm a Shakespeare expert, not a math expert. Um, and, and there you have it. This is the Shakespearean form uh, or the Elizabethan form for a sonnet. There are others, incidentally, and I don't go, I won't go into much, much detail, but Edmund Spencer, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, he came up with the Spencerian sonnet, which, as you would guess, had a different formula or a different uh, pattern. And I believe it was something like A, B, a, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. So he had the sort of, the fours would overlap a little longer. So it wasn't four, it wasn't A, B, A, B, you know, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. It overlapped a little bit. Long and the short of it is, this is a form of compressed communication. It's a poem after all, um, a lyric poem, uh, which has certain rules, which by and large are maintained and then people perform within the within the stage uh, and in poetry recitals. So that's that's a sort of a very very rapid uh, run through of the the formula, the rules, if you will, which govern how you put together and communicate um, a um, a sonnet. That's wonderful. You did that so well. Thank you. I am um, maybe I'm just a nerd, but I love patterns. I love kind of I feel like it's a, a language. And so it's it's like opening your eyes to something you didn't see before. So I love having like the, the secret code that um, so I can go and start looking for it in other places. So I hope that um, students too realize that math is like that. It's sort of like this tool, this hidden language that once you know it gives you power over everything. So I love that, you know, you've gone through and you've You've identified what the pattern is. You've made the references to all that math language of you know quatrains and couplets, fours and twos, and you know showed the rhythm, which is also part of math. So uh, to me, this is just so exciting, and I hope students feel the same way when they're like, "Oh, I see it now. It's visible to me." And Tracy, you made a, a comment when we were going through this a, a while back, which I really loved, which is. This is almost one of the most elemental beginning stages in getting to grips with Shakespeare's language, which is tough for a lot of people, for everybody, in fact, in the 21st century, it's 500 year old language. But the beauty of analyzing by the sound and the rhyme is you don't actually have to even know what those words mean at the beginning. All you know is that they make the same sign, uh, sound and that there's a pattern. And I think that tells students that, that Shakespeare was writing with intention. When people say, did he really mean that? He really did, and he coded it at many different levels. And this is one of those most elemental basic levels of just the sounds, yeah. That's great, I love that, the idea that if you do introduce Shakespeare, maybe introduce the pattern first, because um, it gives con kids control um, and knowledge going into it. So if they feel a little shaken by the language, at least they know I've got the rhythm, I know I've got the math. Right. Mike, anything you wanna add to that? No, this reminds me a lot of like algorithmic thinking and. Uh, some of the stuff that we're teaching kids earlier and earlier now. Um, that's wonderful. That would, it seems more approachable uh, to me that way. Yeah. Well, we're at another pause and this is another one where Alexander is going to jump in and tell us, you know, how everything he just taught us can be completely turned up on its head sometimes. <laughs> So uh, yeah, th so this one was fun. Um, I, it struck me when I read it many, you know, very early on. In this line from Macbeth, one of the witches describes how long she will make a shipwrecked sailor go without sleep. And the line that she uses is, weary send nights nine times nine. So if you want to look at this as a formula, you certainly know what nine is and you know what times is and you know what nine is. Uh, the problem is you need to figure out what senites means. Um, and as any Shakespearean scholar, and I'll do the reveal here, eh, you probably have a clue. Mike, would you like to have a stab at, if, if, speaking of Macbeth, at what senites is? What, 
seven, seven nine, oh, and I, I hope to, I'm sorry if I put you on the spot there. Okay. <laughs> Two from Sailor, go without sleep, weary, sen nights, nine times nine. I have no idea. <laughs> so let me, let me, as in sort of the Wheel of Fortune or Wheel of Jeopardy, whatever it's called, uh, let me give you, um, let me give you two letters to insert, V and E. Ah, <laughs> uh, are there, so it's, are they like weeks? Correct. So seven nights is a week. So seven times nine times nine, which I know the answer because I did the math before we came on, <laughs> is, is 567, 567. But I, I love that too, that there's math problems in Shakespeare. So again. <laughs> right, it's a combination of math and, and language. And uh, the, 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 in fact, the compression of Sen Knights is so that Shakespeare can get enough syllables. There, there are too many syllables. So he had to cut a couple out. So he cut out V and E, V. Uh, and so now it, 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 it scans, yeah. Wonderful. So that's an, the ultimate word problem, right? In the, uh, high, high language and high math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And my apologies to Mike for putting him on the spot. There. I didn't, <laughs> that's okay. I all, all the time. That's why he's here. And he'll do the same to me next week. So it's okay. <laughs> all right. We're running out of time, but let's go into the part four, which is extend. This part I really enjoy a lot because that's the idea of taking the knowledge that your kids have learned from understanding these patterns, this formula, such a great word, Alexander, I wish I thought of that to put in the slides, formula. Sorry. Uh, no, it's wonderful. Um, I love that, you know, I'm, I'm learning uh, even as we're going through this. So formula for, once they have the formula, the pattern, then they can start seeing it all around them. And so these are examples of iambic pentameter in just everyday text or in um, commercials or in music. So thank God almighty, we are free at last. If you count the syllables, that's 10 syllables. It's an iambic pentameter. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I am the greatest Muhammad Ali. We've got another iambic pentameter. Only you can prevent forest fires, smoky bear. It's the end of the world as we know it, REM, and may the odds be ever in your favor. The Hunger Games, it's everywhere. So it's another great way to send your kids out into the world and say, go find me some iambic pentameter and bring it back. And then you as the teacher can have the master list here, which is where I got this from. It's called the most utterly comprehensive list of um, iambic pentameter in everything. So song quotes, commercials, um, you know, uh, politics, music, so all kinds of things here, a wonderful article that the teacher can use. And also, um, besides just quotes, they can also, of course, send their kids to look into music. That is always engaging to send your kids out and say, go find some of your favorite songs and see if it's iambic pentameter, the unstressed syllables followed by stressed syllables, or maybe they'll find a, a song that's not. For instance, trochee, which is um, what we're gonna talk about in a minute. This is a different kind of meter or rhythm that's becoming more and more popular in music nowadays. So whereas iambic was more popular in the past, trochee is becoming more and more popular now. And there's a great video here from PBS Learning Media from the collection Sound Field that talks about how iambic pentameter is being replaced by trochee and how to recognize it in music. So again, just giving your kids that power to find the patterns all around them. Alexander, back to you about trochee in Shakespeare. Yeah, so, um, so there, there are um, alternatives um, to iambic pentameter and trochee is one of them. And once again, we have our old friends, uh, you know, stressed and unstressed. And as it says here, although Shakespeare was a master of the iambic pentameter as demonstrated in his sonnets, he also used trochee meter on occasion. Um, and in this, as you quite rightly point out, trochaic tet tetrameter spell from Macbeth, um, the question is why did he, why did he change up the meter? Um, so the famous line is double, double toil and trouble. Uh, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. So um, the, the, the question of why he changed up the meter is probably, I, I, you know, I'll tell you this, there are a number of interpretations. Um, you know, occasionally you want to jolt the audience and give them a sense that something isn't right. And just as we talk about the heart beating, and that's a natural rhythm, and as Tracy showed you, there are all those lines, which I, by the way, was unaware of, you know, you know, the, the Martin Luther King quote, the Muhammad Ali quote, um, 
So you can create a, sometimes a slight level of discomfort if you move away from that sort of regular but, but thing. So uh, a pattern rather, that, that rhythm, you know, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. if you suddenly go bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, it can be a little disconcerting. There are probably other reasons, but that's the one that I'll go with for this. Uh, do you want to embellish on that at all? What do you think, Mike? about anything we've talked to. Are there any comments coming in? <laughs> I, I cannot stop thinking about how this dominates music. Yeah. And yeah. especially, yeah. and I think you're going to get into it. I've heard a little bit of this. I don't know if you have time, but I, hip hop and rap is dominated by this intonation and this flow and rhyme scheme, uh, maybe even more than things like rock and other types of music. Absolutely. And this may be where your kids really get into it, where you send them out and say, okay, we've been talking about I am at Pentameter. Now go listen to some of your, you know, your um, hip hop and your, um, your rap music. And does it sound like I am at Pentameter? And if not, you know, what does it sound like to you and why? So it's interesting what Alexander just said about, you know, kind of um, against the heartbeat. It's a, a little jarring. So what does that say about our music um, and about the music that's becoming more popular? What does that say about culture? It's, it's interesting. You could get into a lot of discussions about this. I, I, and and you're, I agree with both of you that, that the, um, when, when people decide to create a new form, and I don't want to over academize it, but, but it is interesting, you know, whether it's a song of protest or rebellion or anger, you know, you can sometimes, and often people will take a form, change it, make it their own, spread it out there, and, and it can be very jarring um, in a way that I think is very powerful. I mean, if we were just using the same rhyming schemes and the same uh, intonation patterns as 450 years ago, it'd be quite tedious. Sometimes people need to be shaken up. And when people say, ah, I don't hear the rhyme in that, I don't get it. I mean, putting aside the content, the message, the form um, is a statement. Um, and, and so it is, you know, at the very beginning, I said, you know, why did people create sonnets? And I sort of feebly said, I don't really know. Um, but one reason is to make a mark and make people listen and pay attention and think about the form and then pour in their own content uh, conforming to those rules. So I think rap, rap um, is certainly um, a, a very, very viable candidate for, you know, for, and it, and it seems to morph very quickly, I might add, at a far faster rate than, than it did 450 years ago. Yeah, that's for what it's worth. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're at five, I think we should keep on going um, for the, for the importance of the recording and just finish this off. If you guys don't mind just going a little bit longer, sure. um, cause we're in the last section evaluate. And uh, so this part is really to give the, the students a chance to show what they've learned through the other four sections of, you know, engaging and exploring and explaining. And now they're into um, an extend, extending and now to evaluate, what have you gotten out of this? And so one of the ways that, that you can approach this just to get them kind of warmed up, not to just throw them into writing a sonnet right off the bat, but is uh, for groups to make, to do a sonnet jigsaw where groups come together and they just write half a sonnet. So one group might just write the first eight lines, the first two quatrains, and the other group can write, you know, just six lines, the last quatrain and the couplet. And so you just have little, not really half, but portions of sonnets, eight and six. Um, and have different groups write them and then see what happens if you put them together. So if you put one group's eight lines with another group's six lines, what does it look like as a sonnet? Is it nonsensical? Is it beautiful? Is it both? Maybe try different combinations and then have them recite their sonnets, both you know, as pieces and parts, but also in different combinations. And again, just gives the kids the chance to create something and then play with it. Uh, and move it around again, looking at patterns and structure. Um, what is the word? Uh, deconstructing something and then constructing again. That's another great skill for students that they need throughout their education before they get into the actual final part, which is writing their own sonnet. And um, before we get into that, I did want to turn it back over to Alexander again, just to talk about how even a portion, not a half sonnet, but a portion of a sonnet can be powerful, as in this, um, you know, last bit of a sonnet that ends Romeo and Juliet. So I'm going to stop sharing and let you talk a little bit about that, Alexander, from Wordplay Shakespeare. 
You bet, Tracy. Uh, so um, I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop. You will have seen the slide that Tracy just put up. Um, this is the very end of Romeo and Juliet um, and Act 5, Scene 3. And the last words, uh, the last lines go to Aeschylus um, as they all look on the, the death of these two young kids. And I think I've queued it up more or less. Let's see if we can get this to play. A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. I'll hand the... Uh screen back to you. Um, yeah, and a very, very somber. I mean, obviously the, the actor has performed it in, in a way, it's a sonnet, but it's also lines in a play. And you see there the uh, for format that we expect, brings things, head, punish head. That is a thing uh, in, in Shakespearean English. Sometimes you have to bring out that last syllable and woe and Romeo, um, which is, you know, it's A, B, A, B, CC basically it's the truncated half of a of a sonnet Sorry, I was muted. I love um, how the wordplay Shakespeare does both because right now we're only seeing the words. Um, but I love how you have the word on the words on the left side, the text, and then the video. And so the students can go back and forth and really listen to it, look at it, and again, you know, explore that patterning. Um, so we will talk at the end about how to get um, access to wordplay Shakespeare. But Alexander, why do you think they just chose the last six lines of a sonnet? And didn't have the first eight. Do you have any thoughts about why uh, he, you know, Shakespeare wrapped up this uh, scene and this play with this last bit? You know, I, I Tracy, this is a bit of a guess. Um, but of course, if it is the end of a sonnet, it's also the end of the play, so people can detect that finality. Um, but you could also, equally, unfortunately, for that thesis, you could also argue that why didn't he finish uh, with a sonnet? Um, uh, you know, the whole thing, as opposed to just those last six lines. I haven't gone back to check, but I don't think, in fact, I know it doesn't. The opening scene is of two servants from the, um, from the, um, the Montague family, I think it is, and they are not even in any kind of rhyme or, or scheme whatsoever. You know, this is something to point out, is the iambic pentameter was generally reserved, whether it, if it was in a sonnet or even outside of a sonnet, was reserved for noble people and higher ups in these performances. So servants uh, usually were given just free, free lines. It was just prose as opposed to verse. The thinking being is that if you were more educated, you would be able to perform this business of communicating yourself in rhyming, very metrically sound ways. But the best I can come up with is it, it gives a sense of finality because it's the end of a sonnet and it's the end of the play. Um, yeah. Mm. I think it's kind of sad that they met with a whole sonnet and then, you know, they, like they died at the end with only a half a sonnet. So it does kind of show how sort of their uh, lives were cut short. Yeah, the sonnet was beautiful. Cut short. <laughs> no, no, very nice, very nice. In terms of symbolism, it's like their two lives are no longer with us. These were people who produced full sonnets and maybe we should consider ourselves lucky that we get away with, with half a sonnet. But that's, I really like that actually, that's a good call. And again, that's just something that, you know, that I just came up with it off the top of my head because I've learned so much about patterns just in this session together from talking it through um, with you guys. And so again, it just sort of gives students that power of understanding there's a pattern here. What does that pattern mean um, and how can I use it to interpret things? So just the mm -hmm. power of having the mathematical perspective. All right, so again, um, at the end, you would want your kids to try and create their own sonnet, write it, and also annotate it to show that they understand the patterns, that it has 14 lines, it's in iambic pentameter. They can come up with different rhyme schemes, maybe, um, like the Shakespearean rhyme scheme at the top here, but also the Petrarchan rhyme scheme. So that's not as important, of course, as the first two. What's more important is to have a clear theme, uh, themes usually about love or something you love or feel strongly about. Um, but have a chance for the kids, the students to write their own sonnet and then, of course, review each other's sonnets and give that feedback. 
There's a wonderful form that comes with this lesson plan from K20, this peer review form that we've embedded into the lesson plan um, that your kids can use to peer review each other's sonnets. And then at the end, make it fun by hosting a poetry cafe, move your desks around so they're really rearranged casually, or if you do it virtually, you know, invite your kids to bring their hot cocoa or their tea, have some twinkling lights in the room, and just, um, um, just have it, the, the students can either read their sonnets or perform them if they want to, you know, make them more of a, like a musical or a rhythmic performance, and have uh, this final assessment be part of an actually engaging experience together to wrap everything up in this final step of the evaluation of the five E's. And we are going to end with the last little bit of information about sonnets um, before we uh, tell everyone how to, to get in touch with us at the end. So Alexander, could you um, tell us at the end sonnets in summary? Certainly. So they're a poetic form. Uh, we've figured that one out that Shakespeare used with creativity and mastery within his own written works uh, or independently, but he did them as sonnets or embedded in his plays. And we asked the question, how are the numbers two, four, five, and I probably could have added 10 as well, and 14 significant in Shakespearean sonnets? And with any luck, uh, the response will be, well, uh, there are 14 lines, and within each of those lines, there are 10 syllables, and those 10 syllables are uh, divided into five groups of two, and then within the 14 lines, there are uh, quatrains, which is to say four line subsections, which have an A, B, A, B, or B, C, or C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. Uh, and then the two at the end also references the fact that there is at the end a couplet, two lines to end off the sonnet. So two, four, five, 10, and 14. Excellent, I love that. Very last word, math in sonnets. So um, before I say goodbye, Mike, Alexander, anything you'd like to add at the end? After all of this, uh, this 5E exploration of the sonnets and the mathematics within them? From Alexander, uh, no, I, I have nothing to add. I think, I think what you've put together, Tracy, genuinely is a really delightful romp, um, you know, through Shakespeare and mathematics. Um, it's really well done. My hat's off to you. Oh, thank Incredibly. you. I could have done it without you, so it was a lot of fun. Incredibly impressive. This makes me wonder if there couldn't be another session on, I was just thinking, Alexander, when you were listing the two, four, five, um, the difference between a two, four and a three, and then I started thinking about drummers and the different rhythms, and I wonder if there couldn't be a separate session on musicianship and how it relates to uh, rhythm and tone in Shakespeare. Yeah, I mean, it would require some thought. It doesn't come off the top of my head, not to say that it doesn't exist, uh, but that would be the topic for us to start with a discussion, do a little bit of research and come up with good examples. I think as always, yeah, but that that come in if you want to try that sometime uh, next year and the next uh, poetry month uh, or, or sooner. <laughs> I think you said when we were talking, Alexander, that Shakespeare is in everything. So, I mean, basically we can propose any topic to you and you'd be like, yeah, I think there's Shakespeare in that. <laughs> it's, yeah, the, the, I think what I mentioned is it, it, there are days when I think that Shakespeare in a little way is a sort of a prism. You can shine a subject through him and you can come up, not, not incorrectly, but, you know, I mean, we've just done math, math. I mean, it took us a few discussions to put something together, which is beyond plausible, it's factual. Uh, but the same thing goes for issues, you know, whether it's race or gender or religion and so on and so on. It, I mean, Shakespeare is, to, to coin a phrase, the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, I think it just simply points to his, his remarkable talents. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Thank you. <clears throat> well, everyone, sorry we went over a little bit, but I want to thank you for sticking with us through the, all the five E's. Please reach out with questions to Mike or myself. Remember that we are available to do no cost professional learning with your school or district. We can do this session with you um, or any other content that you might need or here to support you. Please also remember that Alexander Parker as the, the publisher of the New Book Press and Wordplay Shakespeare has very generously uh, provided free access to Wordplay Shakespeare for the 2021 school year. You can go to this website here that is embedded in our site or reach out to, to Mike or I and we're happy to um, pass you along to Alexander so you can get access to that wonderful tool that Alexander you know, pulled out a couple of times and showed you that uh, makes Shakespeare very accessible in terms of both the text and the dramatic production of it. 
Uh, we are going to be posting this recording on YouTube again. And of course, if you'd like a copy of the slideshow, again, please reach out to us at this email. Thank you, gentlemen, both for joining me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned so much. Alexander, thanks again for coming. Um, and we always enjoy having you. Likewise. Thank you for having me. All right. Fantastically interesting. Thank you, Mike. Um, anything from our, our viewership that, that we did not um, leave space for? Um, no, you all covered everything. That was brilliant. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys. Have a great afternoon and see you again soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.